Well, it's an honor and privilege to be with you this morning. And uh, we're just continuing through our uh, series through uh, the book of Matthew. And we are in the Sermon on the Mount. And we are particularly in the section dealing with prayer. And this morning we're going to look at um, one of the most famous passages in the entire uh, Bible. And that is the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Um, but specifically in the context of Matthew and in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I'm calling this sermon this morning Kingdom Prayer. Kingdom Prayer. And as we'll learn, that's a major theme about what Jesus wants us to, to, to grasp this morning. But before we get started, I'd like for us to pray together and bend our hearts to the Lord. So let's pray. Father, thank you for... Um, this honor and this this uh, this privilege that we have to gather here this morning and worship you. We gather, Lord, in anticipation, God, in, in an expectation, Lord, of hearing your voice this morning. And so, Lord, even as you spoke these words some 2,000 years ago, uh, right there on the mountainside, Lord, and people heard your voice and they heard your teaching and they knew that it was coming directly from God, I pray, Lord, that we would, in the same way, Lord, hear your voice this morning, that we would hear what you have to teach your disciples about what it means to follow you, to be citizens of the kingdom, and specifically this morning about what it means to pray, to pray kingdom prayers, to pray from a kingdom perspective. Uh, and that is our desire, Lord. So teach us, as the disciples ask you, teach us to pray. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, and that's where we'll be this morning. Um, and uh, <clears throat> as we begin, I just want to share um, some words from you from uh, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, John, John Piper, in his book, Desiring God, uh, draws this illustration from one of S Charles Spurgeon's sermons. Charles Spurgeon used a, an illustration of Robinson Crusoe. Maybe you've read that book before. Uh, it's a classic book about a man who um, gets uh, is, is abandoned on an island and he basically has to survive. And this is what Charles Spurgeon says about Robinson Crusoe. He says, Robinson Crusoe has been wrecked. He's left on the desert island all alone. His case is a very pitiable one. He goes to his bed and he is smitten with fever. This fever lasts upon him long and he has no one to wait upon him, none even to bring him a drink of cold water. He is ready to perish. He had been accustomed to sin and all the vices of a sailor, but his hard case has brought him to think. He opens a Bible which he finds in his chest and he lights upon this passage. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. That night he prayed for the first time in his life, and ever after there was in him a hope in God, which marked the birth of the heavenly life. That passage that Robinson Crusoe in the book that he uh, that he came upon, and that in the in the story uh, in the, converted him, the Psalm fifty verse fifteen. In Spurgeon explains this verse further. He says, he says, God and the praying man take shares. First, here is your share. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Secondly, there is God's share. I will deliver thee. Again, you take a share, for you shall be delivered. And then again, it is the Lord's turn. Thou shalt glorify me. Here is a compact, a covenant that God enters into with you who pray to him and whom he helps. He says, you shall have the deliverance but I must have the glory. Here is a delightful partnership. We obtain that which we so greatly need, and all that God getteth is the glory which is due to his name. I think Charles Spurgeon had a profound insight into the passage. In our praying, God makes a compact with us. We get what we need, deliverance, and God gets what he deserves, all the glory. And that's what praying is all about, and that's what this kingdom prayer is about. And that's what we're going to see from Matthew chapter 6, uh, Matthew chapter six 
beginning in verse 9. And so if you have a Bible, you can follow along with me. It's also, the text is also in that prayer guide that hopefully, or that worship guide hopefully you received. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Jesus uh, said, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Word of God. So, <clears throat> so what I want to do this morning is I'm just going to break down this, this prayer into just two parts. It's just a simple way of looking at the Lord's Prayer. Two parts. The first part deals with God's reign. God's reign, and the second part deals with our needs, our needs. So God's reign and our needs, and those are the two things that should govern our prayers. Those are the two things that should inform our prayers and all of our praying. So first we're going to talk about God's reign. In verse 9, Jesus says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so last week, if you listen to the sermon last week, we discussed how Jesus was talking about pride in prayer and vanity in pray, praying. And the, and the, the Pharisees, they loved the, the praise of, of going out on the street corners and praying long prayers. But Jesus says, no, we're to pray in secret. We're, to, we're not to crave the affirmation of others, but rather the sweet secret dependence upon God. And then after, And then he also talked about uh, we're not to pray like the Gentiles or the babblers who really, they kind of treated God like a vending machine. If I pray these certain kinds of prayers, if I offer these certain kinds of sacrifices, then God will give me what I really want, you know, my crops to grow or my or my children not to get sick or something like that. They treated God like a vending machine. And God says, no, no, no. Jesus says, no, no, no. You don't treat God like that. If you belong to me, if you have trusted in me, if you have surrendered in, to me, said Jesus, then God is not. You don't treat God like that because God is your father. He's your father. And that's what we, we saw last time. And Jesus, again, uh, in this powerful way, uh, opens the Lord's Prayer by teaching us to pray, Our Father, who, who are in heaven, our Father in heaven. We only have to get four words into the Lord's Prayer to see the glorious brilliance of what it is like to pray in the kingdom of God. For Jesus instructs his disciples that we get to address God in this way, our Father in heaven. So if we're going to work, let's work backwards in that phrase. In heaven, the in heaven part reminds us that this, when Jesus says pray our Father in heaven, the in heaven part reminds us of this, that God is not like us. That's so important to remember. Our Father in heaven. He's a heavenly father. He is, he is God, uh, uh, John, uh, he says that God, God is spirit. God is not like us. He is not a man. He does not have human limitations. Jesus' conception of God is certainly that of the, of the Old Testament scriptures. That is that God is the one and only God who created everything with a word. He is the God who lifts up and who throws down nations. He is the God who floods the earth who parts the seas, who puts armies to flight, and who slays giants. He is the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, and the Redeemer of Israel. He is the one who descended in the cloud before Moses on Mount Sinai, proclaiming his name, saying in Exodus 34, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but, will, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Heaven is his throne, and earth is his footstool, and there is none like him. He is God in heaven, and Jesus says that through him we get to pray to this God as children, as sons and daughters. We can't miss this. We can't miss the weight of what Jesus is saying. As we said last time, the Jews did not commonly refer to God as Father. I'm sure it felt... Uh, I'm sure it felt too familial 
to for a creature to relate to creator in such a, a common way. And yet Jesus turned these tables upside down because, again, he taught us to pray this way, to address God as our father. So as we come to as we come to God in prayer, we don't come to him as 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 beggars to a disinterested uh, king. We come as children to a father. That's how we pray to God. As children to a father. We said last time, you know, uh, oh, <laughs> It's been said only only a children, only only a child could wake up a king in the middle of the night and ask him for a glass of water. No one has access to a person like a child does. No one. And yet Jesus says this is how we relate to God through him. And so what are we supposed to pray to our father? This uh uh the most urgent part of our praying and what Jesus is teaching us here is to be the first and core component of our prayers. As we said, is prayer concerning God's reign, prayer concerning God's reign. That's supposed to be that's supposed to be the first concern in our prayers. And that's what we see there in verse in verse nine and ten that this again, this is the model prayer. Right. So it's not it's not that we're supposed to just pray this prayer in, in a rote kind of way just thinking if we just repeat the words that there's some kind of they're they're magical it, rather it's a model prayer jesus is teaching us that the things in which this uh, the things that make up this prayer is, is supposed to shape and inform our prayers but we also we also make our, our prayers our own we we but still jesus is giving us a a sense of what should be foremost and what should be primary in our praying that is that the primary perspective from which we pray is that is is God's reign. God reigns. Christ is king. Jesus is Lord. That should be the first and primary part of our praying. And thus we pray with all the earnestness that we can muster up for the promise of Habakkuk to be fulfilled. Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. And so the very first thing that Jesus teaches us to pray for is this. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be the name of God. The most important thing, the most earnest thing, the first and, and primary thing in our praying should be this. That God's name be hallowed in the world. Hallowed, come, the word hallowed comes from the same root meaning to sanctify or to make holy. But of course, we don't, we don't make God's name holy. God's name is holy. What Jesus is teaching us to pray then is that the world would recognize God's holiness, that the world would apprehend and understand and grasp just how holy and transcendent and other and great and glorious that God is. To, that people would rightly stand amazed in the br blinding brilliance of God's holiness. And this is the first and foremost cry of the believer, right? That, that God would receive what is due his name. We who have been born again and saved by grace and have been brought, adopted into the family of God. And God now is our loving, gracious, kind, and father. We, we can't stand the thought that people aren't honoring our father like he deserves. And it, it humbles us and it breaks our heart and it grieves us that the great and glorious God who gives to everything and everyone life, breath, and everything is not, is not rendered to what he is due by his creatures. And so we pray that God's name would be feared, honored, respected, and revered as it ought to be. We pray that God would fulfill his promise in Malachi 1.11, saying, for, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Paul in Philippians 2 said, One day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the first and foremost part of Christian praying. That God's name would be hallowed among the world. And if you think about it, this is why we do this is why we do anything. Paul says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We do every anything and everything for God's name to be hallowed. This is why, this is why this is the most urgent part of why we do missions, of why we give to missions, of why we go on missions, of why we send missionaries, of why we ourselves 
go as we are called and take God's name and his praise and his gospel to the other to to the world. Why? To fulfill what God said will in fact happen that from the rising of its sun to its setting, his name will be great among the nations. And so we have this opportunity and this privilege in missions, in evangelism, in our giving and in our going. To to for other people who do not yet at this point render to God the honor and fear and reverence that He is due, and we go pleading with Him and telling them of the greatness and glory of God that may that they too might come under His reign and His lordship and render to Him what He is due. So we pray that God's name would be hallowed, and the next Jesus says, "Pray that His kingdom would come." And so the two closely relate, right? God's name being God's name is hallowed wherever his kingdom is, wherever a heart has bowed down in submission and in and, and, and faith and surrender to him. There his name is being hallowed as it ought to be. And when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we can think about it in two in two spheres. In two spheres, we're praying for God's kingdom to come, Christ's kingdom to come in this age. Where as we proclaim the gospel, hearts bow to King Jesus and come uh, and come and, and enter into citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. And that as the church and the kingdom of God grows and expands, as more and more people believe in him, that's what we're, that's the first part of what we're praying for is, is that uh, Christ's kingdom would come in this world now in this present age. But that's not it. When we pray God's kingdom to come, we're also praying that Christ's kingdom would come in its fullness. Right, it's 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 a longing as well, not just for God's kingdom to grow now, but God's kingdom to come in its fullness when Christ Himself will return, where, where, where every knee shall bow before Him, where He will judge the world, where He will s- separate the sheep from the goats, where He will remove all causes of wickedness and sin, casting them into the outer darkness and the lake of fire, and He will bring into a, He will bring in a new creation. Free from sin, where he shall reign unchallenged, and we with him forever. The very one of the very last uh, verses in the entire Bible in the book of Revelation says, Come, Lord Jesus. That's what we pray. That's what we're to pray for. That's what Jesus is teaching us to pray like. Lord, your kingdom come in this world. Let it come now and let it come ultimately. And all those prayers God hears, and they're just piling up. Those prayers of God's kingdom to come are just piling up till the day when they break through. And God hears, and God answers, and the eastern sky splits open. And every eye will see him. And his kingdom will come. Along this same line, uh, we pray... uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, it, again, it's the same, it's the same sense that where, he, where God's kingdom is, where God's reign is, his will will be done as it is in heaven. And we're praying for all that to come, for all that to come. And so the question is this, the question is this, do our prayers reflect what Jesus places primary importance on in our model prayer. In other words, is what's most is what is most important to Jesus most important to us? Right? If we're if we're gonna follow Christ, if Jesus is our Lord, then it will be, it should be, right? Is what most is what is most important to Jesus most important to us? Is our greatest longing for God's kingdom to come, for God's name to be hallowed in the world, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Jesus is teaching us. He's teaching, he's trying to realign our perspective. He's saying, if you're a citizen of my kingdom, your perspective is going to change. You're not going to want the same thing the world wants. You're not going to pray about the same thing the world's going to pray about. You're going to pray about something different. The first and foremost thing in your praying is going to be my reign, my rule, my goodness, the hallowing of my name in the world. Do we pray with kingdom perspective? Are our, war, are our prayers first and foremost kingdom-minded? Or do they sound just like the prayers, uh, just like an unbeliever would pray? So this is the model prayer. It's not something to be blindly repeated, but it's something to shape our perspective as we pray. So number one, we see uh, that's primary in our praying is God's reign. And number two is our needs. Our needs. In verse 11 there, Jesus says, Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so, again, I think there's, there's, a, there's an order to this. We, we put everything in the kingdom perspective first. And then once we have a proper kingdom perspective in our praying, then we can move down to uh, our practical needs. We, uh, you know, does, does God care about our earthly needs? And the answer is yes. Uh, he cares about your earthly needs more than you do. Uh, you can be sure of that. Uh, but the way we view our needs, however, is to be shaped by kingdom perspective, right? Uh, this, this is huge. This is very important for us, especially us in the prosperous uh, Western world, because, um, you know, that's why it's good to uh, visit other countries as you have time or, or even just crack open a history book and, and realize what, a, what an unbelievably unique place we stand in all of human history to be to have so many comforts and luxuries that we have here in modern America. It's really astounding. And because of that, it, there's a there's a big temptation to and a, and a big struggle if we're all if we're all honest with ourselves to confuse uh, wants with needs, or even to confuse luxuries with needs. But if you think about what most people through most in, most times and most places in most of world history had to live without that we have, it's amazing. It's astounding. And so what Jesus is teaching us to pray is to pray, yes, pray for our needs, but to pray with kingdom perspective. When you read the Bible, we see that God promises to provide for our needs. But beyond that, if we have more than we need, then he expects us to use our abundance to be a blessing to others. God does care about our needs, and Jesus instructs our followers to pray for them. And so we as Christians recognize that God is the merciful uh, giver of every good and perfect gift. In Psalm 145, it says, uh, the eyes of all look to you. You give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. So while we acknowledge the importance of hard work, we, we can say and we must say that by Jesus instructing us to ask God to meet our basic needs, Jesus is clearly telling us that our, our basic needs are ultimately met by God. God is the meter of needs. God is the only one who ultimately ensures that we have what we need each and every day. Because here's the, here's the harsh reality of life, of living as sinners in a fallen, broken world. And that is sometimes, no matter how hard you work, your crops will fail, or you'll lose your job, or the economy will tank, or a pandemic will come. And then you realize you're not in control. And then you realize that despite how hard you think you work to earn everything, everything was really a gift from God. If you have food on your table, it's because God put it there. It's a gracious gift from God Almighty. And since God is a compassionate Father through Jesus Christ, we pray. We pray because Jesus teaches us to pray for our daily needs because it, if we have them, it's only because God gave them for us and it, and it teaches us our sweet dependence on God. To utterly rely on God for everything, including our most basic needs because He's the provider. He, Jesus teaches to teaches us to pray for our daily needs, our daily bread. Surely this is intentional, right? In the wilderness, Israel, when God was giving them literal manna from heaven, they literally woke up in the morning and there was, there was bread on the ground. And as, as this was happening, they, they could only collect enough for a single day, except before the Sabbath, they, they collected two days because... They couldn't work on the Sabbath. And so there were only enough literally to collect one day at a time. What was the point in that? Well, surely there was a point, right? It was this. It was to teach them that, what? That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. They had to wake up every morning saying, if God doesn't show up, I'm not going to eat today. They had to wake up every morning and say, if God doesn't act, I'm going to go hungry. What was it? It was daily dependence upon God. Daily dependence upon God. That is the posture of the Christian heart, is that we wake up every morning acknowledging how needy and how desperate we are for God to provide for us. 
And so there's great danger. There's great danger in wealth, and there's great danger in plenty. It's not bad in and of itself, but let me tell you something. There's great danger in it because we start trusting in our stockpile of goods and stop and and and, and stop and stop trusting in God. And Jesus told a parable about that about a rich man who said, "I've I've." I've, uh, I've collected all these things, and I'm safe, and I'm secure, and I'm good to go. And Jesus said, you, you fool, because tonight you're going to die. And what good will be all the things that you have collected? W- wasted for nothing. God, Jesus teaches us daily dependence upon God. So do you have needs? Jesus says this, if you have needs, pray. <laughs> pray to God. Because God's your father and he hears. And he's just like a, he's just like a good father. A father is not going to keep from his child a legitimate need. I might not give my children ice cream for breakfast, but I will give them something to eat. And God is the same way. He's going to give us what we need when we need it. And oftentimes, usually not before that. Oftentimes, uh, oftentimes he, he's not going to give us what we need before we need it. Why? Because he wants us to trust him. Right? He wants us to trust him. You know, Jesus, uh, uh, Peter asked Jesus, you know, he said, Jesus, command me to step out of the boat onto the water. He didn't know, he didn't know if the water was going to hold him up on that. He had, to, he had to get out the boat before he found out. And in the same way, the, that's the way life works. That's how Jesus wants them to trust them. Sometimes we think, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how this situation is, 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 is going to happen. But God says, I'm in control. And you won't know how it's going to work out until you trust me and just step out of the boat. Because God wants us to trust him. And he is trustworthy. And so he teaches us to pray, not for luxuries, but for our needs. So Jesus, uh, so we have these physical needs, but Jesus also teaches us to pray for our spiritual needs as well, for our spiritual needs. He goes on there um, in verse uh, 12, he says, forgive us of our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so in addition to our physical needs, Jesus teaches us, of course, to pray for our spiritual needs. We, we have physical needs to to survive to live and then while we are alive while we are living we have spiritual needs as well and notice there that we're to ask for forgiveness of our debts forgiveness of our debts and so this is uh i think the the word use here is significant because one way to think about sin right one way to think about sin is that we have failed to render to god what is due to him and that's what a debt is. We have indebted ourselves to God. God is worthy of, of perfect honor and praise and adoration and trust and faith and obedience. He is worthy of that. And where we have not rendered that to him as he deserves, we are debtors to God. We're sinners. That's what sin is. It's, it's not rendering to God what he is due. But God, in his mercy... Through Jesus Christ gives him access, gives us access to himself in prayer so that through Christ we can ask God to forgive us of our sins. And God can righteously forgive us of our sins because of what Christ has done for us. Because Jesus died on the cross and he bore God's wrath due our sin on the cross in our place. And because Jesus rose from dead, from the dead, defeating the penalty for sin that sin deserves, which is death, because Jesus did that for us, we now have a, a unprecedented access to God, saying, not for my sake, God, but for Christ's sake, forgive my sins. Because he paid the penalty for me. And in his name, I ask you to forgive me and have mercy on me. And through Christ, God will. He will, through faith in his son, forgive us of our sins. And so, insofar as we come to God with a true heart of repentance, God forgives all of our sins without limitation. And this asking, and this asking of forgiveness, this confessing of forgiveness, is not something we just, we just do one time, right? Every day we wake up and repent of our sins. Every day we wake up. 
and ask God to forgive us. Every day, every day before we go to bed, we, th- we say, God, forgive me where I have failed you today. And so asking for forgiveness and repenting of our sins is not a task as much as it is a posture. It's to characterize the condition of our hearts. We're to be a, a repenting people. And see, some people, they get that all messed up, you know. Um, they, they, just, they just get that all mixed up. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect. The church is not a place full of perfect people. You don't have to be in church long to recognize that. And some people are surprised when they join a church and they realize that everybody in the church is not perfect. Don't be surprised at that. We're not a perfect people. We're repenting people. There's a difference. We're people who, more than anyone else, in fact, recognizes how far short we fall of the glory of God and how much we need God's mercy every day. The difference is that we recognize is that is, is, is that we recognize that through what God has done for us through his son Jesus, we are also a forgiven people. And that frees us to love and serve God from the heart and to forgive others as well. And that is the next part. Forgive others as we have forgiven our debtors. God Jesus has placed something of a of a of a condition upon our forgiveness, and I'm not going to go into all that this morning because I'm going to devote a whole whole sermon to it next Sunday. But know there that what Jesus is, is, is saying is that if we haven't, if we're unwilling to forgive others, then chances are we haven't been forgiven. You can't truly taste the forgiveness and mercy of God, the greatness of your sin against the Holy God. And then the, 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 the full weight of what Christ has done for you in showing mercy to you, you can't have truly felt and tasted that and still be unwilling to forgive others. And so there is, in a sense, a condition on that. If we don't forgive others, we show that we haven't been forgiven. And then the final thing Jesus teaches us to pray for is this. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, this this last phrase here has bothered some people because James says that God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. And so it seems kind of weird to, if God can't tempt people, um, it seems kind of weird to pray that God would lead us not to temptation. But the confusion comes from the fact that in the Greek, the same word can be translated as test or tempt. It depends on the context. And so we know, in fact, that God did test Israel in the wilderness to see what was in their hearts. And so we don't need to try to force what Jesus is saying here into our modern day categories. What Jesus is simply teaching is this, is that, is that God will in fact test us. God will in fact, for his wisdom, according to his wisdom and his purposes, he will call us to go through trials and sometimes very severe trials. That, at times, can be a source of temptation. The temptation does not come from God. Rather, the temptation comes from our internal res- uh, our I- internal nature and how we respond to that trial. Every, every, uh, we yield to temptation when we respond to a trial in a sinful way. D- uh, God tested Israel in the wilderness. They went, they had to, they had to trust him, right? They had to, they had to go through the wilderness not knowing where their next drink would come from. And they either they had a chance to either respond in faith, right? Respond in faith or to grumble against God. And so the trial became a temptation because they yielded to the sinful nature of their heart. And rather than trusting God, they grumbled against him in the midst of their trial and in the midst of their suffering. And so... And so uh, God does call us through seasons of trial, and God does test us, just as a, a crucible tests gold and purifies gold. But uh, Jesus is teaching us here to pray, to pray that God would not lead us into temptation that would result, w- w- would not lead us into trial that would result in our temptation or our failure, or our failure to endure that trial and temptation. In other words, we're praying that God would not lead us into a situation in which we would stumble, but that he would, he would li- that, but it is still a, a, a posture of surrender saying, Lord, you, whatever you call me to go through, Lord, I believe that you will give me the strength and the faith to endure it without succumbing to unbelief. 
So God, keep me away from those trials that would result in my temptation, in my, in my sinning, and in my failure. In fact, there's an example of this in the Bible in Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation. And um, uh, there's probably in some sense there is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says uh, in Matthew 24, Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is saying there's going to be a severe, severe trial on that day. But here's what you can do. You can pray. Pray that it will not be as severe as it possibly could be. Pray, pray that, pray that God will not call you to go something that through that you would fail, that you would stumble and that you would respond uh, to in unbelief. And Jesus teaches us to pray that. It's acknowledging to God our human limitations. It's acknowledging to God our need for him, for his grace, and for his mercy. It's surrender to his wisdom in calling us to go through trials, but it's also acknowledging our need for him if we're going to endure the trials without succumbing to temptation. Uh, it's trusting that he will give us strength to endure what he does call us to, and that he will spare us from what is not needful for our holiness and for his purposes. And then finally here, Jesus teaches us to deliver us from evil, to pray that he would deliver us from evil. Uh, evil there probably most likely refers to the evil one, that is the devil. And so we pray. We pray that God would deliver us from the devil and from his schemes. The devil is a formidable foe, but he's not... <laughs> But he's on a leash. He's on a leash. He can't do anything beyond what God allows him to do. And so when we're suffering and when we're in a trial and when we're in a temptation, what do we do? We pray. We acknowledge our weakness, but we acknowledge God's power. And we link ourselves to God's power through prayer, saying, God, help me. God, deliver me from this temptation. God, deliver me from this evil one. Um. Perhaps you uh, this week came across um, uh, Derek and Sally Johns, and and uh, um, to just share a brief story with you. Last Sunday, I was preaching on prayer. I got a message this week from Derek Johns, and he said, "I turned, I tuned into your live stream last week, and and I I had a a list on my lap." of every verse in the Bible or in the New Testament, I can't remember, that talks about prayer. And I had that, 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 that uh, sheet of those, those papers on my lap as I tuned into your sermon. And then as you, as you begin to preach, uh, Chad, you, you started preaching through this text in the, in the book of Matthew. And on my sheets, uh, uh, which all the verses of prayer on the very front sheet that I was looking at on my lap were the verses that you were preaching on last Sunday. And Derek said, I know that God had something. I know that God had something to say to me at that moment. And Derek Johns is what? He's halfway across the world. And he's and if you read his updates, you'll know that he's facing a lot of opposition. They go through a lot of unbelievably hard things. He deals with a lot of a lot. He takes in a lot of of, of um, especially uh, they, they, they care for a lot of girls who are abused and things like that. And just just messy, dirty, just difficult painful situations in people's lives and it is just, it's, it is so difficult and it's so hard but i told derek i said derek the reason why you face so much opposition is because you're doing so much good it's because you've jumped into the mess that the devil is after you but guess what we can pray to god to deliver us from the evil one and god will hear and god will answer so what have we learned this morning we've learned from Jesus how to pray, to pray for God's reign first and foremost, and to pray for our needs, both our physical needs and for our earthly needs. And so as I close this morning, I just want to say I, I, I hope your heart has been in, helped and encouraged this morning. I hope, I hope that our prayers as a church will be shaped by the Lord's prayers, that God's reign would be first and foremost in our desires and our affections, that we would and that we would depend on God every day for both our physical needs and for our spiritual needs, and that any abundance that we have, that we would use it as a blessing to other people. And as I close this morning, I just want to say this. Jesus' teaching here, our approach to God 
our, our ability to approach God as a child, which has unbelievable access to our Father who's in heaven, that is that is a gift given to God's children. And to become God's child, in this sense, not everyone is God's child. It is only for those who have turned from their sins and believed in Jesus Christ, who have trusted in his Son, so that through the Son of God, we too become sons and daughters of God Most High. And so if you're listening this morning, or if you're listening online, online, online and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Father, I just want to say this morning that you can. If you'll turn from your sins and you'll believe in Jesus, trust that he knows better than you. Believe that he is king. Believe that he died on the cross for our sins 2,000 years ago. Believe that he rose from the dead. Believe that he ascended into heaven. Believe that he's coming back one day as he surely is. And if you bow your knee and bow your heart to him, he will give you citizenship into his eternal kingdom. And you can live for the one for whom you were made. And you can rest assured that when he comes back, you will not. he, he will not come back to judge you but to save you to redeem you to resurrect you and to glorify you that is the hope that we have in christ and if you don't know that hope i pray that this very moment you will call on jesus ask for forgiveness ask for mercy his mercy is great it's deep it's deeper than your sin and so as we close um that's the invitation this morning let's pray together Lord Jesus, thank you for the truth. Thank you for this prayer. Thank you for teaching your people, Lord Jesus, how to pray. I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, write upon the tablets of our hearts a kingdom perspective. God, help us see things, Lord Jesus, through your eyes. Let the hallowing of your name be the longing of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that it would grieve us wherever your name is not rendered the, the fear and reverence and respect and honor that it is due. And I pray that it would stir us to love, to proclaim the gospel, to preach Christ, to do missions, to send missionaries, so that your name, from the rising of its sun to its setting, that your name would be made great in all the earth. Use us, Lord Jesus, we pray, to that end. And if there's someone who is not a citizen of your kingdom this morning, I pray that this moment they would trust in you and find the peace and the hope that only can be found in you. And it's in Christ's name we pray.